Hi everybody and welcome to the course. Welcome to my course 15 Habits of Effective History Teachers. Thank you very much for uh, joining me. This introductory presentation uh, outlines some of the things that I'm going to touch on actually through the presentation, uh, through the course. Um, and the main thrust of this introduction is all about how we actually raise student attainment in history. And sometimes I don't like that word attainment. Um, perhaps we could say, how do we help students to learn more history? Um, because I think learning history is at the heart of uh, raising student attainment and vice versa. There are five things that I came up with that I think are key. The first one is incorporating recall opportunities into most lessons. So opportunities for the students to retrieve information, review information, to trigger uh, their long-term memories, to trigger um, things that they've done before, to, to reinforce them and to learn them. Because the trend, of course, with Willingham, uh, the work of Daniel Willingham, the work of other researchers is this idea that learning is something that is embedded into long-term memory. It can only be embedded there if it's consistently reviewed, gone back to, looked at again. The second thing, thinking about sequencing, complexity and linking within the curriculum. So in this course and in this presentation, just think about how things are tied together in a curriculum, um, how we think about our curriculum. And when, when I say curriculum, as a classroom, if you're a classroom teacher listening to this, that would be your scheme of work, perhaps, or your medium-term planning in your book or in Google Docs or whatever you use to, to do planning with. It might be with that, and it might be thinking about how am I ordering my lessons Am I ordering them according to the scheme of work? And it has the scheme of work had thought into it in terms of where we're going with this. I, I like that term journey. And for me, when I'm teaching history, I'm trying to take the students on a journey, a journey through history where it interweaves and it, it weaves around and it brings them into some really interesting avenues. And then it comes back onto the main road and then you go down a side street and then you come back to the main road and it all hopefully links together. So they think, oh yeah, I remember when we went back there and went down that avenue. And that kind of make, makes sense now as to why we did that. It didn't necessarily make sense at the time, but it does now. So I think those kind of things are really, really useful. Hooking students into learning. Um, this doesn't necessarily mean like a lesson starter, although I think things at the beginning of lessons that are punchy and actually make things memorable are really, really useful and important learning tools. Um, hooking students into learning might be by using pictures in the lesson, photographs. Uh, hooking students into learning might be talking about a particular event that stirs their interest and makes the learning memorable. Or it might be actually using a tool such as dual coding to actually make the learning more memorable uh, by using pictures with words or whatever the tool is. The fourth one, access higher level subject knowledge. So that's specifically talking about how we incorporate the work of academic historians into our teaching. And finally, source inquiry. So this would be how we go about analyzing sources is key for how the students are gonna achieve in history. So let's start with incorporating recall opportunities. This is a really nice grid, um, Kate Jones. Uh, so if you're on Twitter, you can find her at 87 history. She's produced this retrieval practice placemat and you can print that and put it on the desks of each of your students. And at the start of the lesson, it might be, you know, not religiously, but it might be that you could refer to this just to get them thinking about what they've done prior. And they could do it collaboratively, but also it's a reminder to you as a teacher uh, to not necessarily overlook the power of recall, both at the start of lessons, at the end of lessons, during a lesson, but it's always worth doing. Um, her design of the retrieval practice grid has been very, very popular uh, in the world of education in the last year or two. Um, it's essentially a tool for reviewing past learning and 
The students get one point for something that you covered last week. They get two points for something that, sorry, one point for last lesson, two points for something that they did last week, three points two weeks ago, four points further back. So in other words, it's challenging them to dig into that long-term memory and retrieve information that is harder for them to retrieve. And you, you might do this every two or three lessons. Some, some schools do it every single lesson. But I think it's good practice to do that and retrieve that information. Another version of that is Retrieval Roulette um, by a guy called Adam Boxer on Twitter. You can go there, visit his website. You can download this. Uh, Scott Allsop, from a history perspective, um, has designed something similar in the form of uh, battleships. And you can see his web address here, mrallsophistory.com. You can download this and it generates these questions and then they can play battleships uh, either electronically or on paper uh, using the, the grid. So that's really handy uh, retrieval wise. So I mentioned this thing about sequencing and complexity and linking in the curriculum. And there's this idea here, uh, like I mentioned earlier, of this journey. Uh, they've done it here in, in, in um, almost like a molecule uh, and actually weaving your way the, the different colours represent different topics and you're, you're incorporating lots of different topics as you work through to create that bigger picture. I think that's really powerful in learning. And a way, a little tool that, that I like for that is this Meanwhile Elsewhere grid. Again, you can download this from Richard Kennett or Will Bailey Watson. They have a website called Meanwhile Elsewhere. And on that website, you've got these uh, sheets where students are challenged to look at an event that's at the same time period that you are learning about in your lessons. And it's asking them to look at something else that was happening at the same time in the world. So for example, if it's 1066, you're doing the Battle of Hastings, you might find a meanwhile elsewhere from the same period, but something that was happening in Asia. And it's just broadening that contextual knowledge that they have. And it's challenging them and it's, it's making them think about what was happening in the wider world at that time. I mentioned about hooking students into the learning. Uh, this is one of my favorite starter tasks. If you just have a read of it, And I would present that to them at the start of the lesson um, and they would maybe do this in groups. And then I would reveal who the people were in this particular scenario. So this is a play on appeasement in the 1930s. It's asking them to um, decide who, who, what they would do. And then it links to what the nations actually did. Another one that I use in terms of images, you'll probably have seen this, the Brooks slave ship, uh, the photographs of the Brooks, the plans, I should say, of the Brooks, of how the slaves were actually put into the ship. Really powerful image when studying the slave trade. Uh, Fidei Defence or FD on the coins. Um, how Henry VIII put FD on the coins and it's still there today. I, I like this idea of um, linking to today and linking to the bigger picture, but also making history relevant and, and making it accessible to students. And the fact that Henry VIII knew himself as Fidei Defence or chose to put it on the coins and it's still there now, that's a link from 500 years ago to the present day, really powerful. Einsatzgruppen, uh, the Holocaust, uh, using an image like this of a, a baby and mother being shot by a member of the Einsatzgruppen. Uh, with GCSE or A-level students to get them thinking about the Holocaust and what was happening at that time. I love this one, the, 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 a woman's mind magnified. I don't think you can see magnified at the bottom here, but it says a woman's mind magnified. And obviously this is a poster from 1900, around 1900, um, which was anti giving women the vote, because if we give women the vote, they're only gonna think of these things, aren't they? <laughs> and this one, brilliant. This one is actually Cardiff uh, City Hall, um, 1938, after the Munich Conference. Uh, the mayor of Cardiff actually ordered the swastika to be raised um, above Cardiff City Hall. It's always a shocker for students. I love that. Uh, actually, somebody on Twitter um, told me about that one about six months ago, and I'd never seen this picture before. 
what an amazing image to start a study on appeasement with say to students look what is this where is this where do you think it is and really get them thinking uh plague deaths that's a really nice um one to use talking about the causes of deaths in 1665 um in london you can have some incredible discussions there. obviously you've got plague here 3880 but actually um you can have some fantastic discussions here about the other things that people were apparently dying from uh you know um, and the way in which our medicine through time would be a fantastic unit to incorporate this into uh, there's lethargy you know people dying of tiredness um uh, i was actually mentioning um in a session that i run um uh, recently but but some of them like teeth for example um has some uh, interesting um things around that you can read up on this you can find it online if you just type in um the, the title here, um, Deaths, 1665, you can find this. And there's plenty of descriptions about all these different illnesses and what they actually were. This is another favourite of mine, the sketch by David Lloyd George. Um, so this is when he was at the Versailles peace negotiations and he decided to draw himself a doodle while he was negotiating this incredibly important um, world event. He was obviously slightly bored by it all. And then, of course, um, on interpretations, I will use this and I'll say, right, what can you see in the pictures? And then the students, obviously, um, eventually the, the duck and the rabbit, the, uh, the saxophone player and the woman's face. And this is all about the complexity and interpretations of history, how you can think one thing on face value and then you dig a little deeper and there's another angle. Really powerful um, starter. And with regards to subject knowledge, um, there are historians out there who want to work with history teachers and want to work with history teachers often off their own back, voluntarily. It's fantastic. Um, a couple of quotes here from, from Ben Newmark and Scott Allsop about the power of doing that. Uh, reading and discussing scholarship is a core priority for history teachers. Uh, from Ben Newmark. And then Scott Allsop talking about how um, Richard III's body being discovered in the car park or tomb being discovered in the in the car park in Leicester um, is an argument to regularly update your your historiography and um, what you're teaching the students. Uh, I think it's quite nice to to look at how uh, whether that be you're a teacher or a head of department looking at how you can build your subject knowledge. I like listening to podcasts, so I'll listen to In Our Time on Spotify, the Radio 4 History podcast, uh, quite a lot. And that's something nice that you can listen to in the background while you're doing other things. Um, secondhand books are great. Um, and of course, um, there's plenty of books to read. And I think it's good to, to try and incorporate um, reading into the curriculum and certainly allowing students the opportunity to, to read uh, academic literature in the curriculum. Corinne Goulet, um, who teaches, I think, near London. I've never met her, but she uh, produced this, which is a wonderful uh, regurgitation of a unit about the slave trade. And the key question, why have historians disagreed about the abolition of the slave trade? And she's actually, if you look carefully at the, the, um, the lesson questions, she's incorporated the opinions and the work of historians into much of this unit and into the lesson activities and, and asking students to actually read uh, from academic texts, which I think is, is really important. And trying not to water down that material, try and make it as raw as possible. Sometimes, of course, you will have to change things and you will have to edit things, but I think making things as raw uh, and as relevant as possible is, is, is really great. And there's websites where you can find academic works like JSTOR, uh, and other websites where you can actually find academic sources that students can then work with. I think when, when looking at interpretations, it's it's really good again to, to bring in the work of historians. And this is a an example from the causes of World War I. Um, and this is uh, James Fitzgibbon who did this one. You can find him on Twitter, Mr. Fitz. Um, and this is one of his resources where he's got the historians, he's, he's got where they're from, and he's actually tallied them out. I think that's really powerful for students to see, okay, where are these opinions coming from? Uh, why might they be coming from there? Why do they believe 
uh, that that uh, these particular countries caused the First World War. And I mentioned about historians um, helping out, and this is actually Josh Levine who came to visit uh, my former school and and uh, helped me out in that respect with uh, presenting to students. And this is Karen Knight on Twitter. Again, she approached war workshops and they actually gave her this booklet, which actually tells her about a story of a man from the local area, which is again, really powerful, a link from the past. And you can do activities in class to incorporate this um, with students like this one here, find a historian who. Source inquiry. Um, is, is obviously really crucial in terms of helping students to to better their knowledge. I like this one, the cut out a source idea where you you cut out the bits, you ask students to cut out the bits of a source and then annotate those bits. And it, it just asks the students to look closely at, at different elements of the image, zero tech requirement for this. And the students love kit, cutting and sticking, don't they? Anyway, but it's really nice to, to actually um, look at that and, and look at a source closely and cut it up. Um, and also things like this, grids like this, uh, thanks Alice uh, Southern for this one, and grids like this where the students defer things um, from each element of uh, the image at different levels and then try and uh, work out what's going on uh, in the images. So that's it. Uh, as an introduction, I think those five things, obviously that's a skim and that's, a, that's an overview of some things for you to consider. We're now gonna move on and, and look at the 15 elements in a little bit more detail in each of the lectures. And, um, and then I'll hopefully check back in at the end um, to see how you've got on with the course and, and I hope you enjoy it and, and thanks very much.